Hi, I'm Al Baird, and uh, it's great to be able to spend a few minutes with you and to talk about a couple of chapters as a part of our church past uh, that I've experienced. Yeah, I've been a part of the International Churches of Christ for over 40 years. Doug Arthur and I were partners even before there was an ICOC. I grew up in the Mainline Church of Christ, and where we are today as a movement of God has been shaped by our past. Our roots, as you heard from uh, Steve Kennard, were in the Restoration Movement, and more specifically, in the Churches of Christ. So I want to share with you some of the things that, that I've seen and that I've experienced, specifically in two decades, from 1960 up until 1980, all in the Church of Christ. In my sharing, my hope is that you will see that God is at work in all of our lives in ways that we often don't see or understand. Sometimes looking back over a lifetime helps us understand what God is doing and what he's been doing all along. You know, whoever you are, and wherever you are, God has an exciting plan for you. And he wants you to be a part of taking the good news of Jesus to a very, very messed up world that desperately needs a savior. To consider any time period in the church, I think it's important to consider what was happening in the world at that time some effect on the church. So I'm gonna start by looking at some of the most important things that were happening in those 20 years from 1960 through 1979. Now, if I can uh, share a screen here and get this going. Um, first of all, going back a, a few years before 1960, a very, very significant date, 1954, racial segregation in public schools was declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. In 1963, Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C. Same year, in November of 1963, uh, a date I can remember exactly where I was when I heard this, uh, John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. Then 1965 through 75, a very dark time in our history, the Vietnam War, and uh, a tremendously traumatic and disruptive time. In 1970 or 1968, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. In a totally different way, in 1969, the internet was invented. You know, imagine a world with no home computers, no cell phones, no social media. Uh, the cell phone didn't even become available to the 1980s. So it was a very different time during that time. And then uh, finally, in the 1970s, the birth of the gay liberation movement. Uh, of course, that's definitely a, a growing and a gaining momentum today. You know, I grew up in Texas. My mother uh, became a member of the Church of Christ when my dad was in World War II in the 1940s. And I became a member when I was uh, 15. Uh, these two decades that I'm starting about, uh, talking about, started uh, when I was uh, 20 years old. Uh, if we choose any two decades to discuss in the church, our individual lives, uh, there are high points and there are low points. First of all, let's talk about a low point in the Churches of Christ, and that is segregation. Most of the membership of the U.S., uh, uh, membership of the Church of the U.S., lived in the South and Southwest. Uh, during the 1960s, the population was highly segregated in the South and nearly all the churches 
were segregated. As I mentioned, the Supreme Court declared segregation in public schools unconstitutional in 1954. I graduated from high school in 1957. At that time, all the schools that I knew of were still segregated. That's three years after the, the Supreme Court had ruled. I found a black person. Even the Christian college that I later attended, Abilene Christian, was not integrated until my last year there in 1961. And Abilene was the first Church of Christ college to integrate among the Church of Christ colleges. Uh, even today, most churches of Christ are either predominantly black or predominantly white. Being slow to, great, to integrate is not an upward call for the church that God wants. It makes me sad to think that my black and white brothers and sisters worshiped separately while I was growing up. But I am a pl proud that since the beginning of the ICOC in the late 1970s, it has set the pace for tearing down the walls of color, nationality, and culture. At one point uh, in Boston in the late 1980s, we surveyed the church, uh, at that time almost 3,000 members, and found that there were 90 different nationalities and cultures in the church there. And we, of course, are, are very encouraged by this, and uh, we can take and point to this as a real strength of the church all the way through. Now let's talk about something in the churches of Christ that they did right. When members who served in World War II in countries around the world saw how little of the world had been evangelized just because they were there and experienced it, they felt like that we, we need to get the word of Jesus out. So, after the war, the Churches of Christ caught the vision of winning the world. And in the decade of the 1950s, the Church of Christ became the fastest growing or one of the fastest growing denominations in the United States, nearly doubling in size to over 2 million members. Most of the mission work was done by one husband or one husband and wife team. Uh, you're going to one city or even just one couple in one country. Certainly, uh, th there were a lot of successes during this time, but that was a lonely job. And it was easy to get discouraged and to give up and to go home. Uh, then in the 1960s, a new outreach plan was conceived. Rather than spend it, sending out a, a single couple, why not send out a team of people? So an idea called the Exodus Movement was born. The idea was for a preacher or a team of preachers to travel around the churches of Christ in different congregations and recruit members until they were able to get roughly 100 or so members that would be willing to quit their jobs, sell their homes, and move to a target city. At that time, this was one of the Church of Christ publications that, that devoted one of its uh, issues just to the whole Exodus movement, the idea of what it was, what it was trying to accomplish. This, this was a cover, cover of, the, of that magazine. And uh, one of the articles was called Spreading Christianity by Spreading Christians. And that, that of course, was the idea of the whole Exodus movement. But I want to read here uh, the excerpt from, from one of the recruiting articles uh, that was in this magazine. Who should go on the Exodus movement? Only those disciples with the burning conviction that Christ must be preached to everyone. Only those disciples who've been inspired by the love and compassion of God will respond to Jesus' command to go. The primary advantage is in providing a mission church with members of all walks of life. Teachers, businessmen, engineers, plumbers, barbers, accountants, etc. These Christians can immediately make contact with their own vocational groups that may be, may, may be forever beyond the reach of full-time preachers. This capacity to permeate the community and to achieve a broader base of community relations is one of the chief advantages of the Exodus Church. 
Secondly, the Exodus church begins with committed members, which means that the church will not have to devote most of its teaching energies to build a committed membership, but can move on to the process of evangelism. A family willing to sell their home, leave their friends and loved ones, relocate their children and seek employment in another city does not need to be told the importance of stewardship or personal evangelism. Finally, the pre-organized Exodus church by its sheer force of its numbers and its faith creates a much greater impact on its new community that could ever be imagined. A, a very unique idea at that time. In uh, 1968, I was just finishing my PhD degree at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, Gloria and I had uh, two young girl daughters and uh, we decided that uh, when I finished my degree, we were to go on an exodus to Burlington, Massachusetts. Burlington was chosen because it was the fastest growing suburb of Boston and had lots of jobs. So about 120 of us, including our kids, moved to Burlington. And uh, here's a picture uh, of when everyone got there of, of the team. Uh, a team this size uh, to, to do a work in the city. 120 people, including children. Uh, and uh, it, it was a very exciting time. And uh, then after two years, uh, we were able to uh, build a building and, uh, and, and increased uh, our advantage to reach out to the community. You know, the, the group of people uh, and uh, 15 year experience was a tremendous blessing for us. Let me stop this sharing here a minute. Uh, yeah, there, were, there were challenges that we had to work through, uh, not the least of which was a cost of living. Uh, Gloria and I moved from University of Texas in Austin, Texas at that time. It was the lowest cost of living city in the United States for a city of that size. And Boston at that time, 1968, was the highest cost of living city in the United States. So imagine the impact of uh, people that were moving, all these 120 people were pretty much recruited from the South and Southwest where the cost of living was much lower than it was in Boston. And at that time, uh, most of the wives were stay-at-home wives, uh, stay-at-home moms. Uh, but in order to make ends meet in Boston, they had to go to work. And uh, that was a serious problem uh, because that was not what they were used to. It was not what they imagined, and the people before they got there didn't didn't realize that. And uh, so, in in spite of the difficulties, though, uh, it was a tremendous experience. And, and another short summing I didn't mention though, uh, with the team, is that none of us knew what we were doing, including uh, the three preachers that were on the team. Uh, sure that any of the three of them had ever studied the Bible with anybody, and most of us had never studied the Bible with anybody, and uh, we didn't know each other before we got there. Uh, we all moved there and met each other for the first time because we came from a, a lot of different churches uh, when we got there, uh, so it was a, there was sort of a shakedown cruise that we had to get to know one another. Uh, we had to, to learn what to do and how to do it, uh, and uh, and that was certainly a, a hold back and it took a while to, to work through all that. But in spite of the difficulties, it was a tremendous experience. Uh, these brothers and sisters were tremendous Christians. Uh, that was 50 years ago. 50 years later, many of these people are still my friends. Uh, there were many people that were converted from Burlington during that time. And uh, one of the greatest things for, for me was the spiritual growth that Gloria and I and my three girls experienced. Uh, it's priceless what we learned there. Uh, 
And uh, as a result with that foundation, and then later when we became a part uh, of the Boston church, uh, the ICOC, uh, all three of my girls are now disciples. Uh, they're all married at one time or another. Uh, they all served in the full-time ministry at, at various places around the world. So in closing, you know, God has a dream for your life. It's not always going to be smooth. It's not going to be what you expect always. But he wants to take you on an adventure beyond anything that you've ever imagined. Follow his dream and hold on for the ride of your life. Thank you.